Thank you, Alexis, and thanks everyone for joining us online today. Indeed, uh, for those of you who are with us, uh, when Francisco Minaldi presented an outlook for Venezuela, we called that the last webinar of the year. But then uh, just a small event occurred a week ago today on December 11th in Mexico City, and, and we decided and thought it would be appropriate to have actually one more, the last webinar, this case a virtual panel discussion of indeed the shallow water tender and, and, and the many questions and, and comments uh, everyone has about that announcement. Uh, we have, and I really, really appreciate our panelists uh, responding and being so enthusiastic on such short notice to join us today. Uh, as Alexis mentioned, we have Miriam Grunstein, who has literally written the book on uh, petroleum contracts. And we look forward to her thoughts. And she's a lawyer uh, with CDA, but now is a non-resident scholar at Mexico Center at Rice University, as well as a consultant for Brilliant Energy Consulting. Antonio Sosa, who I'm sure is a, a well-known name amongst those online, is Senior Managing Director at Evercore Partners Mexico. And Evercore is an independent investment banking advisory firm. So again, a very important and unique perspective that Antonio will bring to us today as part of this discussion. And Duncan Wood, uh, the Director of the Mexico Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C., but probably best known for his long tenure at ECOM as a professor and a close follower of energy issues in Mexico for many years now. Um, I want to, uh, in addition to thanking everyone online, I want to spend a minute saying thank you to the companies who make up the Energy Program Steering Group of the Institute of the Americas. These are our annual sponsors, and uh, as we wrap up 2014, we want to thank them for all of their support this year and look forward to their support, and hopefully many of you online support next year. So last week on December 11th, uh, I think the way Secretary Caldwell began his statement was probably the best summary I've ever heard of, of what's gone on in the last 12 months in Mexico. And he said, el dia ha llegado. And indeed, the day has arrived in Mexico, uh, to the amazement of many of us who followed this for so many years, has put out to bid 14 blocks, uh, 14 exploration and production blocks have been offered as the first convocatoria of round one, the international bidding in Mexico. Um, obviously, there's going to be, throughout the course of 2015, several other blocks. But I think what we've all been, been looking forward to ever since the constitutional amendment and the implementing legislation was approved, we now have, uh, via the government, the formal announcement, the draft contracts, the 14 blocks on tender, and just for background, uh, we put up here on the screen, uh, this is from the announcement last week, just the map and then the, the, the contractual areas, the geological province, and the square kilometers of those blocks. Um, I don't want to get into that per se. I want to just lay that out there as the background because I want to invite our panelists uh, to begin addressing what, frankly, are, are some of the questions, and we'll get hopefully way beyond this, but at the beginning point, we put together some questions to ask our panelists uh, to begin with their statements. And uh, I'm not going to read these. They're on the screen. We'll leave these on the screen. Our panelists have seen these, and we've invited them to all give their unique take on these questions, the framing questions, as we're calling them. Uh, there's probably plenty here for an hour, so hopefully uh, we can squeeze all this in and have a, a fruitful conversation. Let me go ahead and invite Miriam Grunstein to, uh, to make her first remarks. And what we've done is asked each panelist to make about five minutes of opening remarks, and then we'll come back and begin to uh, get into some discussion. And as Alexis mentioned, we'll weave in the questions that you all online have using the functions here on the platform. So with that, Miriam, thanks again for your, uh, your, your, your availability and, and eagerness to contribute to our discussion today. Over to you. Miriam? All right, is Miriam there? All right, let's see if we can have an audio difficulty with Miriam. To... Okay, I see Miriam connecting here, hopefully. Uh, there we go. Can you hear me now? We got you, go ahead. Can you hear me? Absolutely, loud and clear. Please go ahead, Miriam. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I said, um, thank you so much, Jeremy, for this effort. Um, and um, hello, everybody. It's good morning still here from Mexico. And um, this is really exciting, as is 
Jeremy addresses the, the surprise and the unexpected nature of a reform of such broad scope, and indeed we have our first PSA. Um, the contract deserves to be um, analyzed um, very carefully. I've had a couple of readings of the contract, but it's a, it's, it's a piece that deserves um, very deep analysis. And um, basically, um, the government has decided to keep the, the schedule going, and we will have um, other projects going on, other, other contractual areas being bid and this year for um, extra heavy crude and deep water at the end of the year, and I think of non-conventionals. So despite low prices and tough times in Mexico in terms of um, political events, so we're moving forward, so it's good. I mean, the Mexico is really pushing forward the reform despite all the obstacles. So we have our first PSA, and, um, and uh, Mexico has decided, at least the Secretary of Energy, CNH, and um, the Department of Finance, which um, drafted the contract, in my view, decided to start with, um, with, with, with what could be the easier stuff. Um, is, as it is a PSA and it involves some um, cost recovery calculation, um, Mexico is very familiar with the costs of um, developing shallow water um, wells. So um, a PSA involving cost recovery and, um, and shallow water seem to be the, the easier target for Mexico to address at this point. Um, and and it, it's from what I see, um, the contract is similar to other contract, already existing contracts in Mexico. I was surprised to notice that the contractual model is actually very familiar to the Chicontepec model, which was inter which is an integrated service contract. So I wonder why the Mexican government decided to replicate many of the provisions in the Chicontepec model, and we should um, analyze the contract in the light of the success of the Chicontepec model. So one wonders, did they replicate the Chicontepec model because it's successful, or did they repl replicate the Chicontepec model because they were under pressure and they had to, they, have, they had to have something to show in this, this December? All right, I'm on the conference. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Miriam. We just got, Duncan just, uh, Came online, but please go ahead, Miriam. So, um, so it's interesting that they, I, as I was um, reviewing the contractual model, I realized that many of the provisions sounded very, very um, familiar. So I went back to the, um, the the integrated services models, and I realized that the that the that the that the new contract is really the replication of the Chicontepec model with a production sharing agreement um, economic fiscal formula. Which in, which in a sense is fine because before, um, be, before, before that, when the Chicontepec model appeared, you had the constitutional restriction by which you can um, share production. But now that the constitutional um, restraint is gone, what you have is an old model with a new formula. And we'll have to analyze very, um, very closely how that is going to work. So that would be my, my initial remarks. Excellent. Thank you for your, your insights on the contract. Uh, I know Duncan has, has now been able to join us online. I wanted to, to follow the order we had, <clears throat> which would, would I wanted to have Antonio Sosa uh, contribute next, uh, but I want to make sure that Antonio is online. And, and again, apologies, everyone. For some reason, we're having uh, lots of difficulty this morning dialing our, our panelists in, and just bear with us. Apologies. We'll get everyone online here. Antonio, if you're there, could you, uh, could you make some opening comments? All right, Duncan, uh, let's just go right to you. I believe you are online. Duncan? Good. You can hear me? Yes, please go right ahead. Fantastic. Well, let, let me just say that, uh, first of all, I was, um, you know, like Miriam, I was lucky enough to be there at the presentation of the contract terms last week, and it was, uh, it was a momentous occasion, I have to say. There was, a, uh, there was a, a, a climate, an air of expectation, obviously, from the private sector. There was um, a celebratory um, feeling amongst the, the people who were up on the podium. You know, uh, uh, Secretary Coldwell began by saying, 
el día ha llegado, the day has arrived, which, you know, it, it added to the, the sense of occasion there. It was, um, there was a general recognition amongst the, uh, the IOCs that were present that this was, you know, it, it's kind of a remarkable thing that we've seen over the past 12 months, that in, you know, just slightly less than 12 months, we've moved from a constitutional reform, which was, you know, huge, far-reaching, really a, a paradigm uh, shift in Mexico, to the passage of the secondary legislation, the formation of regulators, and now the presentation of the contract terms for the first set of uh, contracts under round one. So that was a, a huge achievement. Um, second thing that I observed at the, at the time, which I think was, uh, was, was, was telling, given the, uh, um, the, the, the air in Mexico right now, was this very heavy focus um, on the part of the government and of the Hydrocarbons Commission in particular on the question of transparency. This was an issue which really came out loud and clear, that they've heard the concerns of the private sector, and that they want to reassure them that processes will be transparent, that uh, companies will, re will receive fair and equal treatment, that there is very much a, uh, a level playing field. The third thing which I thought was intriguing was that uh, you, know, you looked up onto the, onto the stage, and you know, in the center you had the representatives of the government and the Hydrocarbons Commission. Uh, to the left you had the, uh, the other members of the Hydrocarbons Commission and uh, you know, some, some important figures there. On the right you had representatives of Mexican industry, including Enrique Ochoa Reza, the, the head of CFE, who of course was the host for the event because it took place in the Mutec Museum, which is owned by CFE. But Pemex wasn't there. It was intriguing. I have to say, you know, everybody noticed it and said, ah, well, like that's clearly a political signal to say that Pemex is just another player in the market. And, you know, we have to wait and see how that's going to translate into reality. But the message that was being sent was, you know, Pemex is not going to receive privileged uh, treatment here. So I thought for, the, for all of those reasons, it was, you know, it was, it was fascinating theater to watch. Then afterwards, talking to representatives of, uh, you know, of private oil companies, they were enthusiastic about uh, the fact that things have moved ahead so quickly. The production sharing model is something which uh, you know, is of some interest to them. It's not obviously as interesting as the, uh, uh, the, the deep water contracts and, and the idea of, of licencias that uh, many of them expect will come out uh, in 2015. Um, but there was very much a sense that you know, this is uh, a sign that things are progressing well with the, uh, with the reforms. Now, they understood immediately that the message that was being sent by giving uh, production sharing contracts or presenting production sharing contracts, first of all, that that message was a political message, that it would have been unacceptable in Mexico to go straight to the licencias, to the licenses. And so this was a case of you know, the government saying, we're not giving up all of the nation's oil immediately. And there was also the sense that this was uh, reflected the need on the part of the government to begin to bring in revenue sooner rather than later. And we saw some of that reflected in the contract terms, in particular to do with rents for the, uh, for the oil fields. So overall, it was a, you know, it's a very interesting package that has been put forward. Um, you know, I, I was able to hear some of what Miriam was saying with regards to the, uh, uh, to the contract terms and reflecting earlier contracts from Chukontepec. Um, I think the you know, it would be interesting to have a discussion a little bit later on about the, uh, you know, the pre-qualification terms and the fact that uh, you know, the, the idea of the consortium is, is front and center there, but also making sure that there's a, a wide variety of actors that are represented. Um, and of course, you know, now we're in this process where we're going to see the feedback from the private sector. We're going to see the government adjusting its contract terms so that by June of next year, they present the final contract terms. And that gives us a very interesting solution. With this, I'll, I'll just finish my opening remarks, which is that after those final contract terms are presented on the 15th of June, you then only have one month before companies have to submit their bids. So that's not a lot of time to actually take that big decision, unless we're not expecting very big changes in the contract terms. Um, but it's this factor of uncertainty that is there right now. Perfect. Thank you. And I, I'm extremely jealous that you both were there at that uh, amazing day last week. And, and I appreciate that, that uh, on-the-site report, Duncan. Very interesting, your comments 
about who was there, who was not there. Uh, we definitely want to get into the pre-qualification. In fact, uh, that's our third bullet point here on the framing questions. Uh, there's a couple other things. I think we've begun to address the first point of, in terms of political will and, and how you all rate the efforts. Uh, I think we've been able to get Antonio Sosa online here. Uh, let me try and see. Antonio, can you uh, can you please uh, contribute? Uh, can you please uh, make your remarks if you're able? Is he there? Okay. Uh, again, apologies. We're, we are going to try and get Antonio online here. Uh, I think he's called in, but uh, we're we're still trying to work through this. So let's 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 get a little bit further into this, and when Antonio comes on, we'll get his input on on some of these questions as well. But let's let's start with uh, we've talked about the first bullet point here in terms of political will uh, and and how we all are just continually amazed by this el día llegado and the fact that this day has indeed arrived in Mexico. But let's move to what else was put on the table uh, last week by the government, and and what I want to get into is the investment numbers. Um, the government touts $14 billion, roughly a billion dollar per block, uh, 26 wells to be drilled in 36 months. I think that's the minimum uh, work program that's uh, it, it set forth. Uh, production, the government has said this could, it could ramp up to about 80,000 barrels a day. So Miriam, let's begin with you. Um, how viable are these targets? But more importantly, Help us break them down a little bit, uh, given your uh, your knowledge and exposure and, and you know research of other contracts, especially of this nature around the world. Well, the the the, the analysis um, that um, that the government did was based on the on the investment rates of Pemex and the investment um, um, rhythm of Pemex in 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 within efficiency brackets. What am I? What am I saying? Is is that they took previous costs of Pemex and and because I mean Pemex has been the national champion in shallow water in Mexico, so what they did is that they did simulations, increasing efficiency in the work programs and investment rates of Pemex, and basically they they based them on that because Mexico has had um expansive um a very extensive works in shallow water. And um, they also um, they, they they also did a, did a comparison based on um, on, on, the, on Asian experience of PSAs in shallow waters, and they they determined um, the 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 rate of 8,000 um, barrels uh, a day, um, considering um, efficiency rates of Femex and um, Asian shallow water um, projects. That's what I understand. Oh, that's great. Thank you for that. Very insightful. And, and Duncan, do you have any uh, any thoughts there on on sort of the viability? Maybe if you have any, you know, what you've been been talking to folks about. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that becomes very clear is that there are there are two factors which are driving um, the interest in Mexico and the enthusiasm for getting involved earlier rather than later. One is that you know you feel as though or companies feel as though the size of the resource in, in the Gulf of Mexico, um, as well as some of the onshore reserves that Mexico has, um, is so large that they have to get involved now so they don't miss out on later rounds. They want to establish a presence earlier rather than later. And this is something which I think is plays to, into the, to the favor of, of the government. Um, and that combined with the sense of, look, everybody else is doing it, so why shouldn't we? Um, it, it, it's extraordinary how often that comes up in conversations, which is that you know everybody is making their move into Mexico right now, and understanding that we are taking a calculated risk. Of course, there's always that risk element, but the fact is is that we want to have the presence there because we don't want to miss out on what other companies are clearly doing. And it's not that companies have taken their final decision about Mexico, but a lot of them are actually opening up their offices there and investing already, you know, quite heavily in terms of human resources, etc. In, uh, in Mexico. And that's, that, that, that's intriguing to see. Now, of course, the factor which plays against it is the, is the lower oil price. Um, but I think that a lot of people are, you know, the standard response is, look, we're a long-term business, and so we make our investment decisions not based upon the oil price today, but where we think it's going to average out over 25 years. That's absolutely true. But in terms of having sort of, uh, you know, disposable cash or disposable capital to invest, that's one, one factor which does play into it. 
but I think that you know that it's going to play to the to the favor of the uh, of the oil companies um, in the short term, just because. It prevents the uh, the Mexican government from readjusting the uh, the terms to make them any more demanding. You know, obviously this is a uh, a highly competitive environment when you're trying to attract capital, and so the Mexican government it, it recognizes that. And I think that we'll see probably some adjustment throughout the uh, um, the the interim phase before the contracts are awarded. So I think that we we're likely to see a high level of interest on the part of the the private sector, and I think that you know there'll be uh, there will be an interest in actually getting those projects up and running. Relatively quickly. I, I think that's a, you make some some interesting points. I mean, I think you know some, some folks could re refer to you know keeping up with the Joneses kind of uh, scenario. But you know, we had a we had a roundtable discussion the Institute of the Americans did on December third, and unfortunately it was before the contract for the Channel Water Tender was announced. But nevertheless, we had an interesting discussion, and one of the panelists uh, from a private firm during our our one panel. Likened the situation in the coming months to the iPhone 6, and I thought it was an interesting analogy because the way it was described was there are those who will get in line 24, 48 hours before the iPhone 6 was to come out, and they'll queue up and they'll be the first, you know, to have it that day. And then there's others who wait and see, and then as as Apple makes its debugging and and, and tweaks here and tweaks there, uh, there are those folks who will then come and buy the 6S, as it were. And, and so I think it was an interesting way to think about a scenario that could play out in Mexico. I mean, again, like you said, Duncan, anecdotally, uh, the competition seems like it's going to be fierce. Um, let, let's keep going here and, and talk about some of the elements. Speaking of competition, there's been a lot of discussion, and we'll move here to our third bullet, uh, about the pre-qualification requirements. And I really would like uh, both of your thoughts, and hopefully we'll get Antonio on the line here as well, about how the government has set up these pre-qualification requirements. I mean, I think all of us who've been looking at this and talking to each other have been, been, been amazed by various levels of, of restrictions they've put in place. But my question I want to start with is, are these kind of restrictions in line, Miriam, for example, with similar international EMP bid rounds for uh, a, a PSA? Um, or could they perhaps be a little bit cumbersome for this shallow water opportunity? So let's let's start there, and then we can go to whether we think it'll impact the positive or negative. Go ahead, Miriam. Well, um, it, it is a very interesting question that you asked, Jeremy. Let's um let's go back a little bit. Um, for for the first time in Mexico, actually, the Federal Antitrust Commission is participating in EMP um, matters because we've broken up the monopoly. And um, competition is certainly a goal of the Mexican government. And the first question to be addressed is how, how, how much do you want Pemex to be involved in the first um, tender process of Mexico? And if you compare it to um, Norway or Brazil or even Colombia, which were the three models um, that were largely followed um, in the course of the constitutional and um, legal reform, you would say that the Mexican NOC is... Um, is very is, is comparatively very much restricted if you compare it to Petrobras. Petrobras in the first round ended up with um, partnering or by or or in, or in standalone um, um, op as an operator of eighty percent of the of the Brazilian reserves, which is which is exactly what Mexico is trying to avoid, except, especially in shallow water. As I said, um, Pemex has been a, notably strong as an operator in shallow water, and they want to give a signal to the market that Mexico is really opening up. So, in the course of the reform, this was a big issue. When you when, when you when you revise the the tender rules, you there is an there is an, an a persisting affirmation in the sense that large companies may not be part of um, more than one consortium. And the the signal is for the IOCs, which I don't think will be interested in participating as much for the shallow water. I don't I don't foresee it, but they might be interested in 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 in, in basically overseeing the process to see um, the transparency and the efficiency of the of the process. What I think that the provision for big companies to um, to form part, to be part of one consortium is largely directed to Pemex. 
The Mexican government, I think, is very intently and very clearly trying to send, send the signal that the reform is to diversify actors. Accountant, sir. Um, Hello, Do, does anybody hear me? Yes, we hear you, Antonio. Antonio, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Miriam is, uh, is commenting on, on uh, and we'll get to you next. Thank you so much. Sorry for all the trouble. Mm -hmm. So, um, Go ahead, Miriam. So um, to conclude, to let Antonio speak, because he hasn't spoken at all, and I'd, I'd also like to, let, like to hear him speak, is that um, there was kind of a, of, a, of a stray path from international practice um, concerning developing countries which open to private investment in the sense that for this first tender, Femex is, knowing, is not going to be included in, in one... In, in more than one consortium for one contractual area, and I think that's I, I think that's a that, that's a response um, consisting in trying to send a signal that um, there's going to be fair game for a multiplicity of actors. That's that's fantastic. Thank you, uh, Antonio. I believe you've been able to listen to our conversation so far. Correct, Antonio? Are you still there? <laughs> Antonio. <laughs> okay, well, let's. Uh, <laughs> apparently, uh, we, we have severe problems with maintaining uh, Antonio's connection. Let's, uh, Duncan, I mean, I, I think we're on this path to discussing the competi competition issue. And, I, I, you know, Miriam has made some interesting points. Again, I think vis a vis Pemex, vis a vis the role Pemex in Mexico down the road. Uh, what, what do you think in terms of your, you know, we, we talked about the Brazil model, the Colombia model, the Norway model. Uh, how are these restrictions in your mind vis-a-vis uh, -vis international? Um, I mean, how do they play out in the international context? I mean, I, I don't think that they are uh, overly restrictive. I think that, uh, you know, as, as Miriam said, it's uh, they're designed to guarantee a multiplicity of actors across the... Do you uh, hear me? <laughs> Antonio is, is coming back in again. But it's, it's, I, I don't understand. The bridge opens and then it closes the... Uh... I think he's gone again. <coughs> yep, Go ahead. Anyway, he's gone again. Yeah, okay. So the multiplicity of actors, I think, is, is one thing. It's also, I think, you know, Miriam's point is very well made about, you know, this is designed to reassure private sector actors that Pemex won't dominate. I think that there was, a, to a certain degree, there was, there was less concern about that simply because Pemex doesn't really have the capacity at this point in time um, to be able to, uh, to participate in too many of these contracts anyway. I mean, Pemex says uh, in public statements that it's, you know, it's interested in, in getting involved in all areas. But let's face it, it's, uh, it's, it's being stretched to the limit already. It has, you know, it's been awarded 83% of the 2P reserves, 21% of the prospective reserves. Have to act on those within the next five years. And so I think Pemex's capacity is, is probably stretched already. But what it does do is it, it shows that I think there's a political message here for, uh, uh, for, for Mexico, which is that they do not want to see any one major IOC dominating. Um, either. I mean, it's, it's not just about Pemex. I think it's about the political message to, to the Mexican electorate that this cannot be about giving up, uh, you know, the Mexico's oil wealth to, uh, to any one of the big IOCs or the big IOCs in consortium with each other. It's an interesting, I mean, it's an intriguing solution. I think it, uh, as I say, it's not restrictive, and it does help to overcome any fears about, you know, competition uh, policy, monopolies, oligopolies, etc. So I actually saw that in a very, very positive light. And, you know, this is going to be, as, as you suggested, Jeremy, this is something that's going to be evolving over time. This is just the first batch of contracts for round one. We've got to go through the other four sets, and we've got to go through, you know, multiple rounds before we actually see what the, uh, the Mexican energy landscape really looks like. A absolutely. But just a, a point of clarification in terms of this first convocatoria, my understanding is that 
there could be some modifications to the contract during this set period of time, but there will be no modification to the pre-qualification requirements. Is that your understanding, Miriam and Duncan? That is my understanding, that the, um, that the, that the Q&A is going to be concerning um, the contractual terms, but not for the pre but not the pre-qualification pre criteria. Now, I have to note something. The pre-qualification pre criteria has already been criticized by the, by the Mexican private sector, which says that it's highly restrictive for, for, for possible Mexican pro players. They have already complained. Yeah. So if the Mexican private sector um, puts enough political pressure, I think that there might be, that, that they might work around the consortiums, the, the consortia um, guidelines so that actually Mexican interested, that Mexican investors could, could potentially participate more. So did any thought there? You know, it's one of the concerns that's been uh, been voiced uh, throughout the process is how much uh, uh, influence would the, the Mexican private sector be able to exert in terms of guaranteeing higher national content requirements, in terms of trying to keep uh, you know, certain areas uh, reserved for Mexican firms. And what's, what's interesting is that, you know, throughout the, the process, they haven't actually been able to achieve very much. I thought... Um, you know, I have to say, I thought that they would get more in the way of national content um, methodology than they than they did in the end. Um, you know, the fact that uh, you know the, the 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 minimum level for these contracts is 25 percent suggests that you know the, the Mexican government has said, yes, we want to keep certain benefits for the country, but we also don't want to price ourselves out of the market. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I think uh, you know Mexico will continue to uh, to to lobby. As, as all businesses do for their own interest. But whether or not they're going to be able to change this is, uh, you know, I, I doubt because, you know, the, the big money is going to be in terms of what comes in from outside. Now, um, on the national content requirements, that is, that is an issue that uh, uh, some firms are, are talking about and they're saying, you know, it's, it, it's a peculiar uh, methodology and calculation there and we're not quite sure whether or not... Um, you know, this is we we want to make sure that we can follow the rules. So they're looking for clarification on that issue, and I think it it, you know, it touch it hits back once again to you know what we all know about the international oil and gas industry is that more than anything they want to have clear, transparent rules that they can follow because the last thing they want is to invest hundreds of millions or billions of dollars and then be told that you've broken the law or you haven't followed the rules, so you're ineligible. I think the, the national content question is, let's, let's wrap up, uh, and, I, and I want to take this opportunity to remind folks that there is a, and we'll move to the questions from the folks online here. Um, let, let's come back to national content, but let me do a quick reminder, and then I want to wrap up this, this, this question of whether the uh, restrictions are going to impact or not from the bidding. Uh, but quickly, reminder to everyone on your right-hand side, uh, about halfway on the screen, there is something that says chat, and you'll see a little bubble, you'll see a flag, and then on the right-hand side is a question mark. So that's where we'd like you to put your questions, and I'll drag one onto the screen. That's, uh, that's what we'll do. We'll put the questions there. I'll drag it out, and, and we'll direct them to our panelists. Uh, so if you could avail yourself of that question mark function, the question function there, and I see a question there already. We'll get to that next. Um, and then we will move to the questions. Uh, I do want to ask, finally, just to wrap up this, this session on the restrictions. Miriam and Duncan, let's uh, just a short answer. Will the restrictions serve the intended purpose? That is, will they uh, incentivize uh, competition in a more plural uh, set of bidders, um, or will it uh, negatively impact the round? Well, it is, it is yet to be seen. Um, it is hard to predict because um, we're facing a tough situation in terms of um, institutional credibility and low price. So the government has had to juggle um, competition with tough price and institutional circumstances in Mexico. My feeling is that um, uh, the, 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 the restrictions might work in terms of... Um, of bringing forward companies that are more adept to um, develop shallow waters, 
but but the other but 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 on the other hand, it might not um, help to have many players or many hitters for this. Some particular particular okay. tender. Yeah, I mean, you know, let's face it. The uh, the international oil business isn't really known for being, you know, an, a, a very competitive industry in the sense of having too many, you know, a lot of big players out there. There's there's a small number of big actors globally, and that's the way it tends to be. We've been through periods of uh -huh. you know, mergers and acquisitions, fusions between uh, between the big players uh, over the the past few decades. And so I think we can probably expect the same kind of scenario to play out in Mexico. But what we, what we can see is that at least in terms of making sure that, you know, one or two firms don't dominate, the, the, the Mexican government has sent the signal that they want to avoid that, that scenario. And, and that's a very, very important signal to be sending. You know, in, and I'm sure that Miriam will, 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 will confirm this, but in the conversations you know, that, that we have with the private sector, it's, a lot of them are, 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 first of all, impressed by the language that's being used in Mexico and that has been used all the way through. You know, I, I had a funny conversation recently with somebody, and I said, well, you know, they, they talk about the fact they want to follow international best practices. And he said, look, the mere fact that they're talking about international best practices puts them way ahead of so many other countries around the world who don't recognize how important that is for us to hear. And now the next stage is, well, are you actually going to implement that? And that seems to be happening as well. And so... I think that you know you've got a bunch of very smart people who are in charge of the process at the at the higher levels in Mexico, and they've listened to what the international experience is. They've listened to what the concerns of both international and and national private actors are uh, are expressing, and you know it seems to be working out so far in a very positive way. But you know, I mean, it, it's it's easy to get carried away with this. Um, obviously, we always want to be skeptical. And, uh, and and critical in a constructive way, but so far so good. No, I, I think. Um, I, I have, go ahead, Miriam. Go ahead. I have a concern. Um, I mean, Duncan is, is is so right when he says that we have very apt, um, hardworking, and intelligent public officers working now on the bid rounds, and um, the Secretaria de Energía, the, Dep the Department of Energy, the CNH, and Hacienda have done a pretty amazing job performing so far. Uh, my concern um, is not with, with this particular tender because, as I said, since they went for shallow water and Mexico is very much aware of the costs for developing shallow water, they're not going to have um, much of a problem choosing an efficient um, company for these fields. My, my, my concern um, is more far-reaching. It's in the administration of this contract. There is a lot of micromanagement from the behalf of the government pursuant to the to the contractual provisions. I mean, the the CNH is 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 pretty much um, is very demanding from the outset of the development program, the work program. The um, hacienda is also very um, it does a great deal of micromanagement in, in terms of audit, auditing the costs. So my, my concern is not now. I think they'll do fine with this first um, tender process. I think they have the institutional capacity to do it now. But my concern is after you have um, these eight contractual area awarded, and hopefully you'll have hundreds and maybe thousands, how is CNH going to do to administer all those contracts and all that information? I think that's... I, I think that's a, that's a material question at this point. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and for anyone who was here in La Jolla last year, we had a, a nighttime session that ended up focusing pretty much exclusively on the human capital, the human resource question. So thanks for that. Uh, let's, let's get some of these. I'm receiving a lot of questions from folks here. Let's just jump right to them. Um, there's one here, Miriam. Maybe you can grab, uh, take a shot at this. Uh -huh. uh, it has to do with booking reserves. If IOCs can't book reserves, how interested are they? Well, um, they've been, from what I've talked to IOCs, they've been ambiguous. Actually, the, they, they can book the expected um, uh, cash flows from the projects, but they cannot um, book is the actual reserves. Yeah. Um, some IOCs whose um, names I cannot quote are fine with that. They are, ex they are fine with um, booking expected cash flows. Others are more skeptical. 
I think that if they have a, 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 an attractive enough economic uh, formula, especially for deep water, that they'll come. If they have a high enough rate of return, I think that booking um, cash flows will not be a material decision for them to come. Excellent. That's, uh, there's another specific question about uh, consortia, and we've been talking about this. Uh, and I think, Duncan, you mentioned, or, well, we talked about the issue of risk and what that means. Uh, and the, the question here focuses on that, um, and specifically as we look forward to deep water, what is the thinking on whether this one consortium will apply to deep water? And I don't know, Duncan, why don't you start, and then we'll have Miriam chime in as well here. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously there, there, there will be concerns about that. But, uh, you know, again, I think it comes down to the fact that this will apply in, you know, any one round of bidding. That's the important thing, is that, you know, if you, you know, so it depends how many blocks are released in each round. What you don't want to have is you don't want to have one company you know, seizing all of the, uh, the the assets in one round because that makes it look like it's a skewed process. Um, and so, you know, I think what we what, what we're likely to see is that these pre-qualification rules will hold, but they they shouldn't be a too big a deterrent um, as long as you're not giving you know you're not offering all of the uh, the available resources um, at one time. And of course, this is a this is a long-term game. I mean, this is something which is going to go on for you know, for hopefully for 20, 30 years. So we, we should expect this to uh, to play out as, as, as it goes along. Miriam, would you like to add anything? Um, I think the, the consortium requirement will be um, will be modified for deep water. I think the, that the government is conscious that you, you need very specialized companies to actually operate in deep water and what, what, what international practice is seeing that maybe smaller companies um, can basically attach to majors in other fields uh, for, 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 separate co for, for separate projects in, in deep water. But, but the truth of the matter is that um, IOCs do not invest in um, specific contractual areas, they 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 invest in countries, and for IOCs, given the social and political um, nature of the circumstances in Mexico, deep water is by far um, the best shot for them. Number one, because it's profitable. Number two, because they already have um, installed infrastructure on the other side of the Gulf, and number three is because they're not going to be in contact with the um, Social and political explosiveness that can be um, a problem in onshore pro in, our, in onshore projects. And given the fact that you don't have that many companies which can operate efficiently in um, deep water projects um, in the Gulf, I think that the that the requirement is going to be modified for deep water. And I think as we've all been talking about, obviously beginning with the shallow water and beginning with the, the, the sort of what they know. I mean. Uh, I think it's, it allows them to, uh, to take the opposite of leading with the chin if they were to start on deep water, which although it's the, the large uh, crown jewel, if you will, it's still coming. Exactly. The, the and, it's, and, it, and, it, and it gives them more time to be more um, reflexive on the contractual model. Because as I said in the beginning, I was really surprised to see that the Contepec model had um, been replicated almost word by word. Some of the stuff, some of the wording of the Chicontepec model is actually quite commercial, with, a, with, with the exception of the economic formula, which has been substantially modified. Um, as now we have a true and honest PSA. Before that, we had uh, a fee per barrel, um, no so not so commercially attractive um, formula. But I think that they started also with they, I think the the the, the, the social um, aspect has to be um, emphasized in that if you work offshore, you're, um, number one, far away from the um, social conflict that may arise working onshore. And right now, Mexico is, a, is under a very delicate situation concerning um, contact with, a, with, with indigenous communities. So um, launching the tender processes with um, onshore development would have been a big mistake, precisely at this point. People, I mean, companies want to be as far away from interacting directly with the communities as far as possible. 
Yes. So I think that was a yes, very me... wise, um, very wise choice. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, just I mean, Miriam makes a very, very good point. Um, un unfortunately, of course, you know, even if you're operating offshore, there's a certain part of your operations that happen onshore, and this is one of the issues that keeps coming up in conversations, which is it's not about obviously about you know relations with with local communities, indigenous peoples, but questions of uh, of property rights. Questions uh -huh. of the rule of law, questions of due process, um, of the justice system in Mexico. Those are actually far more pressing right now, um, I think, for a lot of the foreign companies than concerns over violence or public security, which is you know, what makes all the headlines we, we, in, in Mexico. Mm -hmm. But the recent, um, you know, the recent corruption scandals in Mexico, um, the recent uh, you know, uh, in the cases of, you know, are contracts going to be respected? You know, I'm thinking about Grupo Ego, obviously. Those are things which, which ring you know, warning bells. They, they raise the alarm for, for investors in general. And, of course, you know, oil companies are no different. And so what they're looking at in Mexico, is they, they want to see that they're, they really are going to be reassured that processes will be followed in the correct way, that there is legal certainty, that if there is any kind of dispute, that Mexican courts work. So what they're looking for is they want to see a commitment on the part of the government right now to say, look, we know that we've got problems, but that we're going to we're going to make it better. And you know, it's uh, whether it's to do with public security or whether it's to do with uh, sort of local authorities um, mm -hmm. or whether it's to do with uh, you know overall transparency. I think there's still obviously well, we all know there's a lot of work to be done in Mexico. And what we're what we're all looking for is signs that progress is being made at this point in time. Well, you know, now that you mentioned transparency, Duncan, which is a very, which is a very important point, um, the, the, there was a great deal of emphasis on the transparency issues when the, when the, when, when the contract was launched and that um, fortunately you and I were there when they made the announcement. And all throughout the, the event, there was a lot of emphasis made on the transparency of the process. Right. And uh, I think um, civil society um, can play an important role in um, keeping abreast of how the tender process is performed because a very positive um, side of this is that CNH is very open to listening to the criticisms made by NGOs from academic organizations, even from other companies related to the, the way the, the, the processes are performed. They're, they're, they're very open to listening to, um, to criticisms, to ideas that may enrich transparency and the rule of law in the process. There's no doubt that the, the emphasis on the word transparency and, and some of the restrictions uh, that, that the various agencies are dealing with uh, is, is quite uh, important. Duncan, I think you want to say something real quick. And then let's try, I want to try and go on to a couple other questions here. So, Sure, but just, just to affirm what, uh, what Miriam said, I mean, the fact that uh, CFE on the electricity side you know, is working so closely with Transparencia Mexicana, I mean, that, that's a very important uh, signal to send. And it's, uh, it, it's a very good practice because it shows that you're not afraid of civil society. It shows that you're willing to have sort of an outside authority verifying your processes. And that's something which I think that you know, the, the government uh, and, and PEMEC should be looking at more closely. Uh, yeah, and also the 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 fact that um, the, the interesting issue here, and, and you're absolutely right, um, CFE has has gained the trust of uh, of private investment throughout their um, tender processes. But now the the issue here is that it's not going to be Pemex performing the 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 bid rounds, which is um which is a, the tender process. I'm sorry, which is which is a huge, a huge difference, it's going to be CNH. So an independent um, body from, from, from actually the central government is going to be performing the tender processes. And I think that's a huge step from previous um, energy-related processes that were performed by, by, by PEMEX or by CFE. No, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the change in, in statute for uh, for CNH, but also the creation of ASEA, as it's now known, for the, the protection of the environment. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's. Let, I put a question up on the screen. There's several questions I've received, and, and a lot of them can be sort of bundled into the the framework of how can we or or what do we see in terms of extrapolation from this 
tender opportunity and what it may reveal for future opportunities. We started talking a little bit about deep water. The question on the screen is specifically uh, with regards to um, onshore shale plays. And then this right. brings in something we also probably should, should talk about more directly and talk tangentially about the price of oil. But let's talk about the price of oil, but let's also extrapolate a little bit from this contract, from this tender, to what it means for, in this case, shale. Here it is. Um, Duncan? Mary, <laughs> Mary, do you want Duncan to go first? No, 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 I didn't know you were asking me. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. You know, the, the, the price of oil will, be, will affect dry gas, and because dry gas is heavily dependent on, um, on the extraction of dry gas is, 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 is heavily dependent on, on, on the price of gas itself. Because as we know, um, shale gas is heavily subsidized by liquids or by shale oil. But what's more of a concern for the shale place in Mexico is number one is the lack of existing infrastructure. We have um, no pipelines, no collecting, um, no collecting infrastructure for, for gas. And, um, and we have to guarantee that the existing infrastructure, infrastructure that, is, um, that is owned by Pemex will be effectively be an open access, will be, the, 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 there will be an effective open access policy for the ex existing infrastructure. So number one, we're lacking infrastructure, and the second part of it is that the existing ex infrastructure um, still has to undergo a very effective open access policy. Otherwise, people are not going to be able to do anything with their gas because we have no pipeline. Number two, property rights are fundamental. And, um, and the, the hydrocarbons law established um, uh, an acquisition, well, not, it's, not, it's not an acquisition mode because it, it is, it's, it's something called um, temporary occupation rights. And they undergo a negotiation with, a, with the title owners, with, with the title holders of the land and then they, they pay a surface fee to the owners, and then they have to pay a three percent um, utility to the to for the for the for the for the for the, for the whole extension of the project. Now this is this still is not very clear and, and was not clarified by regulation because a third percent of your of your utilidades how you say that of your revenues yeah. is, is is high. And, 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 it, and it is not clear whether you distribute this 3% of the revenues by landowner or it is, or is it proportionate, is it proportionate to, to in, in terms of land use or land extension. Mm -hmm. So in as much as the government has been, has had a very hard time um, establishing um, a, a regime in which land use can be safely and and efficiently used, they're going to have they're going to have problem with shale. And the the last but not least problem is organized crime. I mean, Burgos region is is has been controlled by the military now for many years, but still we've had um, huge problems with um, with the theft of of the liquids of the gas. And companies have had to agree with organized crime as to the 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 schedule of the of the work. Basically, what they've had to do is um, to meet and agree with um, with organized crime leaders um, the timing of their work so they won't step on each other's toes. And that's the bottom line. And it's difficult, and it's being done. But the government has had, but the government must give more clear answers and definitely more efficacious ones. So a, a, a tremendous amount of work to do between now and yes. any kind of publication of a, a, a unconventional convocatoria. And also, you know, Mexico is not a, a country with a bountiful amounts of water, and they're going to inaugurate an aqueduct from um, from Veracruz to Monterrey. But um, environmental NGOs have been very criti critical of the aqueduct, and um, and now we have um, we have um, procedures which involve the courts that all interested parties in a project and actually challenge 
the, the viability of the project before certain courts. So that may complicate Mexico shale. I'm not saying it's unviable, but I think that the legal and the institutional framework to make it um, viable and commercial is still uh, is still uh, under development. Okay, Duncan, let's. I'd like you yeah, to comment, just but just extrapolate not just. I mean, I think the idea is extrapolating from now to just the, the future bidding. What what? Give your thoughts on that, and then we'll have one final question. Yeah. Okay. So, for, I mean, you know, in terms of shale, it, it's telling that the government, of course, only released eight blocks in, in in shale. It's also telling that those blocks are right up by the U.S. border. It's telling that they're in an area which is controlled by the government and is more or less, you know, stable at this point in time. Um, given all of the factors that Miriam you know, mentioned, I mean, you know, and you can add in the fact that you've got local authorities that really don't work. I mean, uh -huh. I, I doubt that we're going to see a wave of enthusiasm. For, for Mexican shale in the short term. But it is going to happen. At some point, Mexican shale will, will take off. The, the detonator will probably be price again, because you know, it'll make sense at that point in time. Um, and in the short term, what we'll see is we'll see a small number of actors who are interested. There are some foreign actors who are already um, engaged in, 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 in that business. There's um, a number of Mexican actors who want to establish a footprint in shale. So whilst it's not going to be sort of the big play in the short term, we're going to see interest. And you know, over a period of five to 10 years, we should see it gradually picking up in importance. And in terms of you know, what, this, what message this sends for future, for future rounds, I think that's, you know, and we've, we've talked about this a little bit already, is that everybody wants to be there right now to, to at the very least observe how things are playing out. Um, some people are going to jump straight in. Other people are going to come in later on. But uh, it is you know, it's clear that this is such a big play, um, regardless of uh, you know, the short-term or medium-term price of oil, that uh, you're going to see, see big interest. And the, you know, what we're observing in the United States right now is that you know, despite the low price of oil, um, you know, what we're seeing is this is a force for innovation in the shale business. You know, a lot of companies are saying, well, if this is how the price of oil is going to be, we've got to produce oil even cheaper. So they're dedicating resources to try to solve some of the problems that they have already. In, in the case of water, for example, you know, there's constant innovation in this to, to reduce or even eliminate the use of water. You know, there, there are companies out there that claim to have waterless fracking you know, processes already perfected. So this is going to be you know, a, a big driver. Um, you know, the, the price will be a big driver both in terms of innovation and in terms of finally sparking big interest in Mexican shale. Well, thank you. No, I, I, let, let's, uh, I appreciate those, uh, those remarks. Let me, uh, we've, we've talked about this, but let's end with some uh, discussion of the pre-qualifications. Um, but specifically, again, I mean, we keep using a, a crystal ball approach here and saying, what does this 14 block tender tell us about you know, all the other blocks to be on offer next year. Uh, and this question is specifically about the, the financial pre-qualification elements. And so, Miriam, if you could quickly start, and this, this will have to be our last question. Um, talk about what you foresee the financial requirements, or I should say the pre-qualification requirements financially for the future bidding. Well, for mature and true fields, I think the pre-qualification um, um, requirement will be reduced. For unconventional fields in Chicontepec, it depends on the field. For example, there are, Chicontepec is gigantic. It's Puebla, it's Veracruz, it's part of Tamaulipas. And some parts of Chicontepec are very much lacking in infrastructure and are, and are, and are technically more challenged. For those areas, I don't think that the, that the financial requirement will be reduced because we want, we want to be, have big players. Because those, those areas in Chicontepec are, are tough and have suffered ex exactly because of that. Because, I mean, people have, 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 have they have an underinvestment. They haven't underinvested, but they haven't invested in the right way in Chicontepec. For mature unsure fields, what I understand is that um, the, the, the Mexican private um, sector has already um, voiced significant interest in that they could be the national players for mature unsure fields. So certainly, to keep the, the the Mexican private sector happy, 
they'll I think they'll 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 they'll, they'll lower the financial requirements for the type for those type of fields. And actually, Coparmex made a public um, presentation and um, in some public fora. So I'm not um, I'm not betraying everybody anybody's trust in the in the sense that they presented the Secretary of Energy with a um, with a with a with a significant list of um, unsure fields um, that they'd like to uh, operate in the future. Thank you, Miriam, so much. Duncan, I will give you the final word as we wrap up our panel here this morning. But let me first apologize uh, to everyone. Uh, we, for some reason, were not able to ever resolve the technical issue to be able to bring Antonio Sosa online. I apologize to Antonio personally and to everyone who's expecting to hear his insights. But with that, Duncan, your wonderful insights uh, will wrap us up here today. <laughs> a lot of pressure, Jeremy. Um, just, I mean, hey, so Stephen Gerrard from outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean I think that uh, you know the message was was quite clear uh, in this uh, the first batch of, uh, of of contract terms is that you know firms need to have experience in, uh, uh, in 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 operating in the oil and gas sector, or at least you know the the lead firm in any consortium has to have that experience. And that's a very, very important message to send, which is that we want players who are going to come in, who are going to do it right, and who are going to make a success out of it. We don't want companies who are going to come in, who are going to bid, who are going to win the, the contracts, and then not be able to fulfill. The key element here, I think, is that the, the Mexican government wants there to be a, uh, a flow of fiscal revenue and of oil barrels from this first round of contracts sooner rather than later. And that's especially important given you know, low economic growth in Mexico, given the low oil price, and uh, given the fact that, you know, I mean, at the moment there's a certain degree of, of, of economic instability in Mexico because of the, uh, you know, the, the peso has been, has been sliding. You know, on a, on a side note, the, uh, the slide of the peso actually helps Mexico a little bit, which is that you know, operational costs in Mexico will go down a little bit. Um, and also, any every dollar that comes in from oil revenue is worth more than it was a few weeks ago. But that's not really something you want to, you know, peg your economic future to, um, a, you know, a weak currency. And so I think that uh, you know, this is, these terms are are there to to try to get the right kind of actors in to try to ensure that there is diversity there, um, but also to open up the possibility for Mexican firms to be part of it. You know, Miriam's point about the future. Um, future contracts for, uh, for for onshore mature fields. That's a, I mean that's a particularly juicy area I think, which has you know a lot of potential both for national firms and for foreign firms. So it's going to be uh, you know a lot of those fields that Pemex abandoned are not even mature. I mean they were they were drilled into and then Pemex sort of lost interest and moved on somewhere else. So there's a lot of oil to be had there, and I, I expect that's going to be a very very interesting uh, bidding round when it when uh, when it opens up. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I, I have to, uh, to use, I mean, I think there's no probably better quote than uh, the famous Winston Churchill, because I think we are all so excited and we're also, you know, enthusiastic and looking forward to what's going to happen. But we, it bears mentioning as, as the famous Churchill quote or something like this, that this is not the end, it's not even the beginning of the end, but maybe exactly. just perhaps it's the end of the beginning. And, uh, uh -huh. you know, I think it bears mentioning and the point we've all been making here is the idea of endurance of these reforms couldn't be more important. And I think everything we've seen so far is, is points in that direction. But again, it's perhaps only the end of the beginning. So thank you, Miriam Grunstein, and, and thank you so much, Duncan Wood. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, at the last minute, so we pulled this together. Uh, we, we tried to navigate technology as best as we could. I sometimes wonder if we really are about to turn the clocks to 2015, given uh, technology challenges, but anyway, we'll keep working on it, and we look forward to, to seeing everyone here in La Jolla, having you join us online for our webinars, or better yet, in person at our events around the hemisphere. Thanks, everyone. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy holidays to Thank all. You all guys.